Good morning. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here. And uh, following this wonderful presentation and letter from Vivian, it really gives a great feeling for what we're here to do today. Let me just get myself set up. Early childhood education no longer has to fight for its place in the sun. More and more, parents, educators, and policymakers understand and appreciate the critical importance of early learning for all children. Not long ago, the former CEOs of Procter & Gamble and Macy's published an op-ed in the, in the Times, I don't have to say New York Times here, in the Times under the title Capitalists for Preschool in which they put forth the business case for early childhood education, and a substantial case can be made. In the past decade alone, evidence has accumulated showing that investments in young children, especially children at risk and children with special needs, can have a significant return on human capital expenditure, a return of at least $7 for every dollar invested. Research shows us that programs targeted toward the earliest years outstrip those focused on older students many times over. Early interventions can make a difference that can last a lifetime. Investing in early childhood makes sense. Despite this, this nation does not devote sufficient resources to the first years of life. The UNICEF report card ranks the US as 26th out of 29 wealthy countries when it comes to our children's well-being. Over the past decade, as a nation, we've experienced no real growth in overall preschool enrollment, unlike many other highly developed countries where young children have access to such services, the U.S. has stagnated. A recent report tells us that across the countries, making up the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD, 70% of three-year-olds are enrolled in preschool. In the U.S., it's 38%. Unfortunately, too often in the U.S., you recognize this? Too often in the U.S., when early education is the topic, adult values rather than children's development are the focus. Take a look at this magazine cover from a few years ago. It focuses on parents' needs for their young children to excel and describes the test prep industry in New York that was intended to give an advantage to those children whose families could afford expensive coaching and test prep. Not only does this kind of thing distort children's performance, it also contributes to a rise in child and parental anxiety and a loss of validity for the tests. As the caption on this cover says, if a four-year-old aces an intelligence test, she's often set for life. Trouble is, that test is worthless. It's worthless because once someone has been coached on a test, the test is no longer a valid marker of that person's knowledge, skills, or abilities. Instead, it becomes basically a test of rote memory. Nevertheless, it may get you into your school of choice, and depending on the school, the contacts you make there, beginning at pre-K, can benefit you for a long time. Just ask Frederick Jones. <laughs> but there are bright spots on the policy horizon despite the most recent midterm elections. In his last two State of the Union addresses, President Obama has recommended a universal program of early care and education, does this sound familiar? Intended to provide all children with the opportunity to attend high quality preschool, regardless of their family's income or where they live. The president views early childhood as a key component in an effective education system that prepares students for success in school and in society. In, other, in his words, early education ensures that none of our children starts the race of life already behind. As I've alluded to already, spending on young children by the US government places us 31st out of 32 countries tracked by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. Despite this dismal record, it's easy to imagine that the primary objection to the president's program in Congress, especially in this Congress, is likely to be that we can't afford any new social expenditures. 
But as I'm about to demonstrate to you, rejecting high quality early education is the far more costly alternative. Today, only two states, Georgia and Oklahoma, have enacted universal pre-K. But as you know so well, more and more cities and states are exploring the possibility of expanding their commitment to early care and education. The problem is money and where it is directed. Whether we're talking about New York, Maryland, or Nebraska, a lot of the policy conversation comes down to the question posed by this article in the Washington Post, how will we pay for this? You get a sense of how severe this problem is and where the nation's priorities are by looking at this figure. It shows the national average per pupil expenditure of public dollars for schooling during children's first 18 years of life. Basically, it demonstrates that our expenditures on children's formal schooling are completely upside down, concentrated on the older end of the age continuum. According to data from the Urban Institute, average annual expenditures on high school students across the country are around ten dollars to $11,000 per pupil. When you look at state and federal expenditures for preschool, that number is cut in half, driven to roughly $5,000 and continually, continuing to decline rapidly in recent years. This number is driven primarily by the cost of Head Start, typically a much more comprehensive effort than state programs. But the clincher comes when you look at the public funds devoted to infant and toddler care. The amount of public dollars allocated to zero to three-year-olds is just $300 per child, 35 times less than what we spend on high schoolers. Now, politically, it's ill-advised to advocate transferring funds from high school to the creche. But I do believe that this situation is irrational, given the importance of the early years. The vast majority of our resources are downstream with the oldest students, yet the data I'll share with you shortly tell us that the most productive and efficacious developmental rewards are to be found at the beginning, upstream, in the first, in the first eight years of life. All of this makes what Bill de Blasio has done all the more exceptional. By far the most ambitious local program of early education reform in this country. New York's UPK program, as you know, better than me, calls for the enrollment of more than 24,000 previously unserved four-year-olds this year and an additional 17 to 20,000 more children by next year. It will require the preparation and hiring of well over 1,000 teachers in that time and will cost more than $600 million over just its first two years. What's more, classrooms and materials have yet to be purchased and equipped, at least all of them, from what I hear, and at least 60% of the programs will take place in CBOs, in community-based organizations, where, like the district-run program salaries for fully prepared teachers, will be set somewhere around $50,000 a year, which, given that the average nationwide annual salary for childcare workers with a BA is $29,000, is practically revolutionary. Needless to say, the potential of the UPK program is tremendous, though the risks are equally great. But all that's in the future. For now, the city has pulled it off, or at least has started pulling it off, as this beginning of school editorial in the Times makes clear. By the way, the New York Times is delivered to Omaha, Nebraska as well. I just want you to know. <laughs> Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have moved there. Uh, in the words of the editorial writers, 50,000 is a small city's worth of children, each getting a head start on a lifetime of learning, 50,000 kids. I have to tell you, the entire K-12 enrollment of Seattle or of Atlanta, let alone of Omaha, is less than 50,000. And that's how many four-year-olds are in care here. This is quite an accomplishment. Efforts as massive as this one bring the question back to why so much attention is being paid to the first years of life. And that's what I came here to talk about today. I'll begin by explaining the rationale for early education and early intervention, and then describe how the science of early learning has become so compelling in recent years that it may ultimately turn around the misplaced values that, we ha that have left our youngest children and those who care for them 
on the short end of the allocation of our public resources. For some time now, one of the most influential public policy arguments about the importance of early childhood has been its contribution to the growth of social capital. The person who's given voice to this position most eloquently is James Heckman, who received the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in the year 2000 and is a professor at the University of Chicago. He's the only Nobel Prize winner I've ever gotten to know because I lived in Chicago. We had lunch and dinner together, so I feel particularly close to this. But he's devoted his career over the past decade to studying the impact of early childhood education on the growth of social capital. He points out that learning starts in infancy, long before formal education begins, and continues throughout life. Early learning begets later learning, and early success breeds later success. Success or failure at this stage lays the foundation for success or failure in school. What Heckman is telling us is that a proper accounting of human skills recognizes that early advantages reinforce each other. They reduce the cost of future learning. In other words, if we want to do something about the disadvantage caused by starting out in adverse family and community environments, we need to invest in children while they're young. In fact, I've heard Jim say that if he were advising a governmental authority about where to put its money, where to invest its money in the stock market or in young children, he would choose young children because there's a much bigger payback from early education than, uh, in, than in future earnings in reduced crime and delinquency, less special education and so forth than you'd ever see in the stock market. Let's look at how this works. This figure shows us the return on investment for every dollar spent on early intervention. That's the vertical or the Y axis as compared to starting remediation at a later time in life. And that's the X or horizontal axis. In contrast to the documented significant long-term gains from infant and from preschool interventions, later remediation efforts have been shown to be much less effective. School-age remedial programs for children and youth with disabilities, to use one illustration, generally have a limited record of success. Other types of post-school programs, for example, job training programs, adult literacy services, prisoner rehab, education programs for disadvantaged adults have also yielded low economic returns. Although these investments are clearly beneficial, the advantages gained from effective early interventions far outpace those of later remediation and may preclude the need for any of those interventions. That's what we have to pay attention to. Why is early intervention so effective? Why does it seem to provide such long-term benefits? One of the main reasons is that it's in the early years when brain circuits are formed. According to Dr. Jack Shankoff and the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child at Harvard, the foundations of brain architecture are established early in life through a continuous series of interactions in which environmental conditions and personal experiences modify genetic predispositions. Shankov points out that beginning from the moment of birth, over 700 synapses are formed each second in all parts of the brain that basically become the foundation of who we will become as people. And because specific experiences affect specific brain circuits during specific developmental stages, it's incredibly important to take advantage of early opportunities while children are young and to do so in a careful and developmentally informed way. Matching the quality of a child's early environment to appropriate experiences at the right stages of development can influence how well the child will be able to think, learn, and regulate emotions later in life. Here we see illustrated the idea, that, the, really it's the idea about developmentally appropriate practice. The idea that sensitive periods occur at different ages for different parts of the brain. Although more brain growth occurs in the first five years than at any other time of life, because brain circuits mature at different times, different kinds of experiences are critical at different ages for optimal brain development. 
relatively low level or primitive functions, the, the light blue dots you see here, like seeing and hearing, are in place before or soon after birth. And the neural connections responsible for language and speech, shown here with the red dashes, also have an early start in life, and they're established early on. But if you look at the higher level neural circuits, the solid blue line that process sophisticated aspects of, of the world, such as communication signals, including thinking and reasoning, these capacities emerge over the first five years of life. But I always like to tell those of you with adolescence at home, some brain growth does go on after that. <laughs> Just want to make you feel a little better than you, what you might feel otherwise. So the early years of life matter because the mutual influence of early experience and gene expression affect the architecture of the brain. And this leads to the emergence of a whole range of intellectual, emotional, artistic, and practical capabilities, as well as the development of the immune system. Remember, it's not nature versus nurture, but nature and nurture. As these complex neurological and experiential systems mature, they establish either a sturdy or a fragile foundation for all the developmental achievements and physical and mental health milestones that follow. In the words of one Yale neuroscientist, brain development cannot be put on pause. Synapses, the connections between brain cells, undergo tremendous change during the early years. A four-year-old's brain uses more energy than it ever will again. And synaptic development is both biological and environmental. We know from developmental research that the young mind is astonishingly active in self-organizing, creating new knowledge from everyday experiences. In fact, it's almost impossible to be a pessimist when you work with babies. The human brain is self-correcting, and it feeds on new experiences that lead to new learning. What we've learned is that brains, skills, and health are built over time by multiple sources, but starting early is what counts. Language is a great example for us to use here because it's a cognitive skill that develops gradually, and it's also highly dependent on timing for maximum achievement. We know that languages are acquired rather easily early in life, but as an adult, Language learning requires great effort and is never learned as thoroughly as it is in early and in middle childhood. I'm sure that some of you have discovered this on your own when you decided, you know, I'm finally going to go back and I am going to learn to speak Spanish, right? I took Spanish in junior high, a little bit in high school. I had to take two courses in college. Still can't do a thing, but I'm going to go back and learn it. But it seems so difficult now. You know, did, I, did something happen to me? Why is it that we're having this trouble? Well, what's happening? is that you're finding out that the dependence of language learning on age can't be ignored. This dependence holds for first languages and, and for second languages, for spoken languages and for sign languages. Researchers tell us that for most people, a thorough command of language is attained when learning occurs before around seven years of age. I'm not saying you can't learn it later, and I'm not saying that there aren't a lot of individual differences around this, but statistically, Language proficiency decreases progressively, as you see here in this, in this slide, when language learning is delayed beyond around seven years. As I hope you've picked up, this isn't all about biology. What keeps all this going is, as the topic of this entire uh, conference is, about relationships. Relationships are the engine of development, and in early childhood in particular, this engine of, of change is best described as sensitive parenting. The most important educators in children's lives are their families. Researchers teach us that what families provide in the way of encouragement, experiences, expectations, and security has a decisive effect on a child's life chances. Simply put, babies can't do it alone. They need parents and well-trained caregivers to connect the resources of the world to their interests and aptitudes. This is how their potential is realized and their future growth is ensured. Nurturing relationships and responsive interactions provide the strongest foundation for later learning, behavior, and health. 
These relationships can help build strong brain architecture and can prevent or reduce traumatic stress in children. The impact of relationships is really quite astonishing. As shown by an incredibly interesting study I want to share with you concerning the development of phonetic skills in infancy. And I see that I sort of lost part of the, uh, this slide. But uh, what that says at the top is impact of relationships on the acquisition of phonetic skills in infancy. By phonetic skills, we mean the ability to hear and reproduce sounds in the environment. Early in development, infants have the capacity to distinguish all sounds across the languages of the world. But infants' universal capacities narrow with age, and by one year, infants' abilities to perceive sound distinctions not used in their native environment begin to disappear. Think about it. Any of you who have traveled to countries where the, the languages are very, very different from English or from from the Romance languages or, or the Germanic languages that you're accustomed to hearing, and you hear sounds that you cannot even reproduce, but babies can. It's not so much that they're that much smarter than you, it's that that's the environment in which they're being, they're being raised. In other words, infants' universal phonetic capacities are strongly influenced by the distributional frequency of sounds contained in ambient language, that is, the sounds they hear, the sounds they're exposed to. But for right now, what I want to do is to focus on how social interaction can influence infant learning. This is a study by researchers at the University of Washington, and they exposed four different groups of infants to a foreign language, to Mandarin Chinese, at nine months of age. None of these infants had heard Chinese before, but only those in the group that experienced the new language during social interchanges with other people showed any learning. What you see here in the first group are American infants exposed to Mandarin Chinese in the lab learning Chinese phonemes and words rapidly after they spent time with a native Chinese speaker dur during naturalistic play. The second group consists of babies with, with very similar backgrounds who had no exposure to the training or to the play, but were tested for comparison purposes. They provide a baseline for us. For infants in the next two groups, they had the same auditory input at the same age and for the same duration as the first group, but the one on the left entirely by audio and the one on the right through watching, I'm sorry, on the left was audiovisual, basically watching uh, uh, DVDs, and the one on the right, audio only. And, um, and, but, they, so, but they had no social interaction. They just had the sounds coming at them. Those children on the right showed no learning. The difference was relationships. Relationships are powerful. But timing is important as well. One of the lessons we can take away from the research on language learning and neural development is that the ability to alter behavior decreases with age. Essentially, the longer a problem is ignored, the harder it is to change or to remediate it. But our colleagues at Harvard tell us that the window of opportunity for development remains open for many years, but the costs of remediation grow with increasing age. The reason for this is that neuroplasticity, the ability to modify and change neural connections, decreases with age. Brain circuits are built in a hierarchical, bottom-up fashion and stabilize over time, making them increasingly more difficult to alter. It's more efficient, both biologically and economically, to get things right the first time than to try to fix them later. Early intervention, especially for children at risk, is essential. So why is it that some children don't thrive? There are many reasons, including accidents of birth, genetic abnormalities, illness, malnutrition, homelessness, limited parental education, or absent parents, among many other causes. These are what we might call micro-reasons for poor outcomes. They're conditions that affect individuals. We also need to consider some of the more macro or societal reasons that have dramatic impacts on children and on families. They include, first, inequality. 
thought of primarily in terms of economic insufficiency and all that that brings with it. Second, incoherence or discontinuity between the schools, agencies, and organizations in our communities that are intended to work together but often function as silos that are disconnected from one another. And third, insularity or isolation, the state of being detached and isolated, which is how many children are raised instead of being cared for in a situation that combines the benefits of school, family, and community. Today, I'm going to focus primarily on the first issue, inequality. According to Columbia University economist Joseph Stiglitz, inequality is contrary to our meritocratic ideal of America as a place where anyone with hard work and talent can make it. He points out that those who are born to parents of limited means who do not receive extra help, who do not receive intervention, are likely never to live up to their potential. This is a frightening prediction from a Nobel laureate in economics and the former chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Today, children in other rich countries like Canada, France, Germany, and Sweden have a better chance of outdoing their parents than American kids have. More than a fifth of our children, 20%, live in poverty. This is the second worst of all advanced economies, putting us behind countries like Bulgaria, Latvia, and Greece. In Stiglitz's words, our society is squandering its most valuable resource, our young. Inequality is so pervasive and so destructive of the values of our democratic society that it's overtaken all other explanations for why our educational system is so often described in terms of an achievement gap. According to calculations by the OECD released in 2012, socioeconomic background explains 15% of the variation in the performance of American students, far more than in other high-performing countries. Estimates are that only 1 in 20 children coming from the most disadvantaged, disadvantaged quarter of the population manages to excel in school in the U.S. What this, the, the, this uh, caption says is estimated gaps in reading achievement between black and white and high and low income students by birth year, which sounds like, oh my, but listen. Here's some evidence that shows the impact of inequality on the achievement gap, evidence that may be surprising to you. Let's face it, many people think of the achievement gap in terms of racial differences. Though most comparative data primarily concerns black-white differences rather than other minority-majority comparisons. But recent analyses show us that the assumption that the achievement gap follows a racial divide is false. These are data from the National Assessment of Education Progress, the NAEP, the nation's report card, and they show that the achievement gap is less a racial gap than it is, a, uh, th than it is a, uh, an income gap. And you see that here with this blue line. In fact, sociologists point out that family income is now a better predictor of school success than race is. The information here demonstrates that with the exception of minorities living in the deepest poverty, the racial gap has been healing for the past 50 years, but the inequality gap has been growing wider. Between 1978 and 2008, a period of 30 years, the discrepancy between the average math and reading test scores of children from high and low income families grew by a third. Sean Reardon, a Stanford sociologist who is responsible for this slide, tells us that if we look at the test scores of white students only, we find the same growing gap between high and low income children that we see in the population as a whole. This is not strictly about race. The growing test score gap is also reflected in a widening difference in completed schooling and many other kinds of measures that we use. This is family income and school readiness gap. This gap in achievement between children from more affluent and less affluent families begins to emerge very early. Here we see data from the Early Childhood Longitudinal Study, a study of more than 23,000 nationally representative uh, children. I was one of the principal investigators of this, and we studied reading and math and general knowledge of entering kindergartners across the nation and then followed them for five years. The study has been now replicated a couple of different ways in different times. This figure dramatizes the achievement gap attributable 
to family incomes. It shows the relationship of average academic ability to family wealth. We see that here that even before they entered kindergarten, children in the highest SES quintile group had scores that were 60% above those in the lowest group. In terms of effect size, the differences are really quite huge. And the disparities in children's cognitive performance at kindergarten uh, entry attributable to socioeconomic status are, were significantly greater than those associated with race or with ethnicity. These results show us that when children from, from lower income families enter kindergarten, they are on average far behind their wealthier peers in the areas that are so much a part of school success. As some say, these kids are behind at the starting gate. The question for us to face is why these SES differences emerge and what we can do about them. A recent study gives us a powerful starting place for answering these questions by looking at the impact of poverty and neglect on brain growth. Researchers at Washington University studied 145 three to six year olds and followed them up with MRIs during their elementary school years. These children included healthy preschoolers as well as those displaying clinical symptoms of depression. And what this slide shows are the variables the investigators studied to determine whether poverty during early childhood actually changed the brain, affected brain development at school age. It includes the mediators the researchers considered, parental education, caregiving practices, and stressful life events, as well as the main effects of poverty, what they call here income to needs ratio, and brain growth, studied by means of magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. This study's results are extremely important because they demonstrate an empirical link between poverty and poor developmental outcomes that point to some critical mediators of this effect. The study tells us that compared to non-poor children, MRIs of children living in poverty show reductions in both gray and white brain matter and in hippocampus and amygdala volumes. Neurological findings, what this means, these, these findings are associated with deficits in learning, in memory, in intelligence, and emotional health. Moreover, the researchers note that these effects, which were mediated by caregiving support and by stressful life events, they, in, they had a, a huge impact. And the child's environment, in other words, and early life experiences can become woven into the child's, in, uh, into the child's neural and biological infrastructure in such a way as to impact developmental trajectories and outcomes for years to come. Another way to understand this is to recognize that the quality of early caregiving is critical to healthy development. As the neuropsychologist Charles Nelson has said, exposure to early life adversity should be considered no less toxic than exposure to lead, alcohol, or cocaine, and as such, it merits similar attention from public health authorities. Let me give you another practical illustration of the impact of poverty on children's development. And in this instance, I want to focus on language and on vocabulary. The opportunities to acquire vocabulary are not equally available to all children. As I've been telling you here, and has been reported in both the popular and the scientific literature, by the time a poor child is one year old, she's likely already fallen behind middle class children in her ability to talk, to understand, and to learn. The gap between poor children and wealthier ones widens each year, and by high school, some say it's a chasm. We learn more about this from an important study that was published in the mid-1990s. Betty Hart and Todd Risley, and many of you have heard this research, researchers from the University of Kansas spent nearly three years intensely observing and recording the language of 42 children and their families from Kansas City. Every month they visited those families and recorded samples of parent-child verbal interaction. Over a six-year period, they transcribed and analyzed every word that was recorded in those homes. Their study focused on children from three different income groups, professional or high socioeconomic status families, mid-SES families, and very poor or low-SES families who were receiving welfare at that time. Hardin Risley gathered an enormous amount of data during the study and subsequent longitudinal follow-ups and were able to estimate the size of the gap 
between the vocabularies of children from very poor versus children from professional families in the first three years of life. By age three, preschoolers of high SES families are typically able, and many of you know these numbers already, typically able to say more than 1,200 words. Preschoolers from mid SES families, around 550 words. And those from households resi residing in, in poverty, just 250. What's more, by age three, children raised by professional parents, and again, you've heard this uh, a lot, this number, had heard 30 million words compared to children of poor parents who had heard only 10 million words. That's a three to one difference. The high SES professional parents not only exposed their children to more words, they presented more words of all kinds to children. So there were really huge differences. This is an example of parental impact on child development. It also appears to be an effect of social class. Over the years, the Hart and Risley study that I just cited for you has been criticized for pathologizing the language and culture of poor children and for confounding the amount of language that children hear with estimates of their overall vocabulary size. But recent research has strengthened the conclusions we can draw about the link between SES and children's vocabulary study. In a study published just recently, it was in 2012, Anne Fernald and her colleagues at Stanford show that differences in language learning and verbal processing speed between children of low versus high income parents are detectable as early as 18 months, something Hart and Risley weren't able to show. Between 18 and 24 months, the vocabulary size of children in their study increased on average for both higher and lower income family children. But at 18 months, barely half, the children in the lower SES group had 50 words just 50 words in their vocabulary as compared to fewer than a third of the children in the higher SES group with just this small number of words. At two years, at 24 months, children from the high SES families produced nearly 450 words on average, while children from low SES families could produce only around 300 words. The study confirms that the pattern the, the, the pattern of developmental change in vocabulary varies as a function of social class and begins to show up very early. The vocabulary differences of this study uh, are equivalent to nearly a six-month gap by age two between infants from more advantaged as compared to less advantaged families. In the words of the principal investigator, this is the beginning of a developmental cascade a growing disparity between kids that has enormous implications for later, their later educational success and career opportunities. Overall, this research provides a scientific basis for understanding the achievement gap. And we know this because we know that size of vocabulary is highly associated with the ability to learn to read. And you can easily imagine how critical that is to school and to life success. The results I'm going to show you make this point. They demonstrate that only one-third of U.S. fourth graders are able to read proficiently at grade level, while two-thirds are unable to read proficiently at grade level. This information, this is national data, comes from the NAEP, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, administered in 2009. In 2011, when the test was administered again, the results were no better and they were no different several years before when, when it was also administered. Needless to say, children who are poor do very badly on the NAEP. 83% of children from low-income families failed to receive, to reach the proficient level. Inequality is a pervasive and a corrosive element of our society and it's responsible for a huge casualty count among young children. The question we have to face is, how can we break out of this cycle? What can we do to change it? How do we alter this pattern of school and life failure? What I want to propose to you is that high-quality preschool and early childhood experiences, beginning at birth and extending through third grade, have the potential to change this pattern of poor outcomes. The most classic study in the preschool intervention canon is the Perry Preschool Project, also known as High School. Again, very familiar to all of you. But you'll see why I'm bringing this up again. This study was intended to have an impact on the achievement of children living in poverty and was meant to reduce or even eliminate some of the consequences of economic inequality. It consisted of a random assignment of just 123 four-year-olds 
from a low-income African-American community in Ypsilanti, Michigan, near Detroit. All the children had initial IQs of 75 to 85, which is in the range of mild mental impairment. Half went into the treatment group and half into the control. Those in the treatment group received four days a week of cognitively oriented preschool with a very good teacher-child ratio and one day of home visiting. The children were followed until they reached their 40s. More has been written about these children than probably any other group of children who were ever enrolled in preschool. What you see here is really worth thinking about because it helps us to understand the impact of, that the impact of preschool is not simply on how many facts and numbers you know, it's something more than that. But let's begin by focusing just on what I'm showing you up here. You can see that it shows initial gains for the treatment children, and then a dramatic fall off, sometimes known as a regression to the mean, once preschool ends and elementary school begins. This is particularly evident when you compare the treatment kids, who are the orange up here, when you compare the, the, the treatment children to those in the, in, the, in the control. This looks like the gains of those in the experimental preschool treatment group fade out, and that's how it was interpreted, as were the results of other studies done about, about Head Start at the same time, and very recent studies as well. Fade out is a big issue. There's hardly a, a legislator, a politician I speak to, who doesn't want to know about fade out. Now, what does what do these data I just showed you, what do they tell us? Do they mean that early childhood intervention is a false promise, as I hear some critics say? Do the gains last just a short time and then disappear? Is all of this, in fact, an illusion or a fade out? From an early education perspective, here's how we define fade out. No matter how beneficial early childhood programs might be, their benefits can be undermined by schooling of systematically poor quality. That's what fade out is to me. The cautionary tale here is that early childhood education is not an inoculation against all the bad things that can happen to a child. And one of those bad things is to go from a great preschool into a dreadful elementary school especially when the child doesn't have the support of a highly motivated family and an intact community. Recent data from the National Center on Education Statistics confirmed this pattern of poor elementary schools for poor children. A 2012 survey showed that children living in poverty experience substantially lower quality of school experience than children coming from more affluent families. And this, this, kind, this kind of finding has been shown repeatedly in the research literature. Nevertheless, although the Perry children were subject to the same set of problems that I've been describing, that is, they attended elementary schools that were not nearly as effective as the experimental program they were enrolled in as preschoolers, over time, they outperformed the control group. And they did this both in school achievement and in a number of areas, other areas, that may be even more important in the long run. One way to think about these unexpected results is in terms of sleeper effects, impacts no one could originally have predicted. Sort of a little bit like developmental sleeper effects for any of you who are fans of the TV show Homeland, right? All right. We define, here, here's how we define sleeper effects, or I define sleeper effects. Long-term outcomes, that emerge later in life and provide a stable foundation for subsequent performance. The important idea here is not that there are sleeper effects per se, but what the sleeper effects seem to be. One such result is a significant cognitive or academic boost to its participants when it's measured more accurately by assessments of achievement rather than by IQ. These effects appeared later in adolescence. We also know that high quality preschool can do something else, something of potentially incredible value. It can improve children's non-cognitive skills. These skills, mentioned often by Heckman, re refer to self-control, persistence, and self-regulation, among others. It's these characteristics which many believe to be malleable, that is, more flexible or open to change, and more powerful 
than general intelligence that seem to be the most important predictors of success in school and in life. They enlarge our perspective from focusing simply on early intervention to a broad emphasis on early learning and character development. As I mentioned, some of the ways the treatment or experimental group did better than the controls or the, non, the, the, the no program group are, are pretty straightforward. These data with the experimental group uh, in, uh, shown in orange and the controls shown in blue show us that those enrolled in the experimental preschool outperformed their matched controls by being placed less frequently by more than half in special ed by having three times the academic achievement of the controls and, and being at least 20% more likely to have graduated from high school on time. A possibly even greater significance is the evidence that shows us that as the children grew older, the difference between the experimental and the control groups also grew in terms of indicators of social capital. These findings reflect results from when the children were age 27, almost 25 years after preschool. What we see here is that upon reaching adulthood, compared to the control group, those who had attended the preschool programs earned more money per month, they were more likely to own their own home, and were less dependent on welfare. What's more, they were more likely to remain married, less likely to get in trouble with the law, and have many fewer children out of wedlock or as teenagers. These results, of course, are quite impressive, but they're not unique to the Perry Project. Among the better known programs that have shown similar long-term results are the Child Parent Centers in Chicago, which are still going on, and the Abbasidarian program, which had its origins in North Carolina. And there's some new data from the Abbasidarians. These recently published findings are, are worth, worth thinking about for a moment. Information came, has recently come out about the health effects in adulthood of this frequently replicated, randomized, birth through early elementary school program for low-income disadvantaged children. And what they do is they carry this, this discussion of sleeper effects to another level. The results I'm about to tell you about concern the program's health benefits three decades after the intervention occurred. Some recently uh, uh, data were, were collected on treatment and control tra cases from the beginning of the subject's participation in the program through their mid-30s. The study reports that children randomly assigned to the treatment group for ages zero to five have a significantly lower prevalence of risk factors for cardiovascular and metabolic diseases in their mid-30s than those in the control. The evidence is especially strong for males. One in four males in the control group is affected by, uh, affected by metabolic syndrome, whereas none in the treatment group are so affected. So, there's a great deal of research here that shows over and over and over again, however you want to look at it, early intervention is important, it is meaningful, it is life-changing. In fact, recent research led by Heckman and his colleagues favors a particular explanation for why all of this goes on, for these powerful effects of early intervention. And what they are looking at now, and what I've mentioned already, is the acquisition of non-cognitive skills. These skills, for example, conscientiousness, perseverance, sociability, curiosity, caring, complement, and provide a scaffolding for cognitive skills, but relate more directly to character development, something that's shaped not just by schools, but by families and social environments as well. According to Heckman, non-cognitive skill development is a dynamic process in which the early years lay the foundation for successful investment in later years, much as we were talking about how the early years of neural development lay the foundation for what will come later. Heckman is not the only person thinking about this. You can read about this in Paul Tuff's most recent book, and also in the work of some years ago when Zero to Three, the National Center for Infants, Toddlers, and Families, brought together a group of child developmentalists and asked them to list the characteristics that were most essential for helping children thrive and become successful in school. The list they came up with was called Heart Start. It defined non-cognitive skills as those skills that are intended to teach children to manage or to regulate their emotions and behavior, effectively communicate and learn, and sustain positive relationships with others. In what follows, I'm going to describe seven such skills. 
My purpose is to help you better understand why we believe that early childhood programs for birth to eight years of age where, uh, are, are so important, where these skills are incubated and first emerge, and why they're so critical to success in school and in life. First, confidence. A sense of control and mastery of one's body, behavior, and world. Confidence is the child's sense that he or she is more likely than not to succeed at what he or she undertakes, and a belief that adults will be helpful in achieving his or her goals. Second, curiosity. This is the sense that finding out about things is positive and leads to pleasure. The more pleasure a child takes in his or her curiosity, and the more she's reinforced for doing it, the more she views the world as a place that's safe to explore and learn from. Third, intentionality. This consists of the wish and the capacity to have an effect on the world and to act on that desire with persistence. It's a characteristic that clearly is related to a sense of competence and of being effective. The more intentional we are, the more we can accomplish. Fourth, self-control. The ability to modulate, control, and regulate one's own actions in age-appropriate ways. This is what constitutes self-control or self-regulation. Fundamentally, it's a sense of inner management of one's feelings and one's emotions. Fifth, relatedness. Relatedness is the ability to engage with others. It's based on the sense of being understood by others and understanding others. And the more it's reciprocated, the more you want to engage in it. Sixth, capacity to communicate. The wish and ability to exchange ideas, feelings, and concepts with others. This is the characteristics that's related to a sense of trust in others and a sense of pleasure in engaging with others, including adults. And finally, seventh, cooperativeness. Cooperativeness is the ability to balance one's own needs with those of others, to learn that the more one works reciprocally with others, the more they're available to work with you. Characteristics such as these can't be left behind. When you develop a curriculum that you feel is cognitively the most, uh, the most central, the most important, the most needed of all, you have to also wonder about how am I handling these characteristics, these non-cognitive characteristics. These characteristics enable children to respond to direction, to pay attention, to communicate effectively with peers and adults, to cope with stress, and to feel motivated to learn. This is what learning in school success is built upon, and it has its origins in early childhood programs and in early childhood family experiences. Children who display these qualities typically have success in the classroom. They're at lower risk of disrupting the school environment, becoming ostracized by their peers, falling behind in academic skills, or experiencing problems that can lead to academic failure and to school dropout. Children who have begun to internalize these non-cognitive skills are actively in the process, truly, I believe, of becoming ready for school. School readiness is not just about knowing your letters and sounds or being able to label colors and shapes. School readiness is about fostering children's overall developmental competence. For this to occur, we can't rely on what happens in school alone. Children don't exist in isolation. Families don't exist alone. Schools can't do it alone. And teachers need to be partners with parents in the community. All of this begins in early childhood. All of this is what we need to be thinking about as we think about the potential risks of inequity and inequality in our society. Children who have begun to internalize these non-cognitive skills are the ones who are really getting ready for school. As I've said, schooling, uh, school readiness is about many other things besides just knowing your colors and, and your shapes. And furthermore, we have to remember that what happens in school is only a small part of what happens in a child's day. Findings from a study by McKinsey and Company bear this out. They found that students spend less than 15%, one five, 15% of their childhood at school. The rest of their time is spent at home, a good part of sleep, or in the community. What this means is that we have to think broadly, systemically, holistically, 
children don't exist in isolation. Instead, we need to include all of these elements in what we're doing. We need to think about the ready child equa equation to ensure that children enter school ready to learn. It's essential to consider the family and the community context in which children live and the schools they attend and the services that are available to support healthy growth and development. It's only when all of these elements are combined that we can, help, we can hope to raise healthy and successful children. Fundamentally, we must understand that readiness is not something in the child, nor is it something in the environment. It is the product of all of this. I want to sum up by reminding you that the evidence about the impact of positive early experiences is clear and compelling. This figure shows us that preschool enrollment can reduce the school achievement gap between poor and more affluent children. It's based on data from 73 countries in which the research is controlled for gross domestic product, or GDP, and other factors. What these researchers learned was that for every percentage point increase in preschool enrollment, and I assume that's quality preschool enrollment, the achievement gap between high and low income children declines. As more and more students participate in preschool programs, fewer and fewer failures occur. The evidence for preschool intervention continues to grow. There are more than 150 high-quality scientific studies from all over the world that demonstrate that early educational intervention can have major short and long-term effects on cognition and social development, as well as on school progress, earnings, reduction in antisocial behavior, lowered welfare participation, fewer teenage preg pregnancies, and even reduction in trouble with the law. Many different kinds of programs across various social and economic contexts have been shown to be effective. Nearly all of these successful programs involve schools, families, and communities. In closing, let's remember the words of the great developmental psychologist Jerome Bruner, who, according to the program, will be with you tomorrow. Well begun is half done. One of the pioneers of research on early intervention, Bruner began his, his work little more than 50 years ago. Since then, we've learned a tremendous amount about children, about brain growth and its role in the development of the self, about how early intervention can improve school performance and reduce the need for special education, about how children acquire language and can gain a head start on learning to, to read through being exposed to vocabulary at an early age, about how relationships are the active ingredients in character development, about how early childhood programs depend on strong communities and stable families, about how starting early con contributes to social capital and the long-term strength of our economy, and about how early intervention is not an inoculation, it's an investment. In Bruner's words, the importance of early childhood for the intellectual, social, and emotional growth of human beings is probably one of the most revolutionary discoveries of modern times, where emotional and mental growth are concerned, well begun, is indeed half done. In an article published in The Economist magazine, we read that the real issue is whether the US can realistically roll out the kind of learning that feeds minds and helps the economy grow. The magazine reminds us that on America's route to becoming the wealthiest nation on earth, it's notched up any number of oppressive achievements. Landing on the moon is easy, says the economist. Teaching millions of four-year-olds and doing it well is much harder. I'm here. I, I'm here to tell you that the challenge lying ahead of us is in fostering early childhood development, that, that the challenge lying ahead of us in fostering early childhood development is probably more important than space travel. We know what to do, and we know when to do it. We also know how important our mission is. The early years of life matter. Thank you.